So, how do we represent spatial vector data coordinates in Python? Okay, so there's a couple packages that we're going to use. Uh, one that we're going to use in the background is called Geos, Geos, whatever. Um, and it's a C++ library, which is actually a C++ port of the JTS topology suite, which is a Java library. And we're going to access it from Shapely, which is a Python wrapper of the C++ library. Very complicated. Um, okay. So that's not all that important, though, because we're really just using Shapely. Um, and it implements uh, the OpenGIS OGC simple features for SQL specification. So it's a way to query and uh, interact with simple features. Um, and it specifies all sorts of different uh, spatial and geometry functions, and I'll show you some of them in a second. Uh, so it's an OGC specification as well, just like the simple feature specification is. Um, it is a complete and consistent, robust implementation of fundamental algorithms for processing linear geometry on the 2D Cartesian plane. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Basically, what it lets us do is do geometry operations for points, lines, and polygons. Okay? It's also an o uh, OSGO project. Shapely, which is Got to be one of my favorite Python libraries. Um, it is the Python wrapper for this, so you can do geometry <coughs> evaluation, different geometry operations. Uh, you can represent geometries in different ways using the simple feature specification. Um, and it does points, lines, strings, and polygons, and multivariants of it. And it's BSD license, or modified BSD license, which means you can use it wherever you want, which is great. Um, so Shapely is um, pretty cool. You can do things, so say you have two geometry, Shapely geometry objects, okay? You can do things like geometric operations. So you can do like, these are like set operations, right? You can do like a difference, symmetric difference intersections, unions. You can calculate the centroids of polygons. You can calculate the boundaries of the polygons, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can also do unary and binary predicates. So is this thing a simple feature? Uh, is it, does it contain, does this polygon contain these points? Does this polygon cross this polygon? Do these lines cross, et cetera, et cetera? You can do buffers, convex hulls, all sorts of cool stuff, including transforming geometries, like stretching and skewing and uh, tra uh, transform, transforming them in various different ways. And these are some of, the, this is the best part. Uh, so it knows what to do with well-known text and well-known binary representations of geometries. So we can read those in and, and deal with them. Pretty cool. Uh, it also has a NumPy array interface, so we can get all of the coordinates from a geometry really easily, just like you can do uh, in NumPy. Or, uh, yeah, NumPy. And it implements the Python geo interface. And this is really cool because it really uh, means... It, it aids in interoperability of Python packages that deal with geospatial data. There's a link to the geo interface, uh, which is actually just a gist. Um, I have it up here somewhere. Right here. Oh, yeah, it's a gist with a um, RST file, and it kind of specifies this uh, implement or this uh, specification, I guess, just geo interface, kind of like the NumPy array interface. If you're familiar with that. Anyway, basically, it, it means that if packages implement this, then you can always call geo, you can get the geo interface, you can get the geometries, the features of any object that uh, implements it. It's pretty handy. Um, and lots of guys are using it now, including ArcPy, PySAL, GeoJSON, Descartes for plotting, all these different libraries. So it makes uh, exchanging geospatial data in Python Super easy and good. Okay, so go, go to that link if you want. Uh, okay, so this is kind of what Shapely does, okay? So we have here from shapely.geometry import line string, okay? And line string in Shapely is pretty much exactly the same as the line string well-known text representation, except it's you're using Python objects. So to make a line string, it's just a list of point tuples. Right? It's pretty much exactly the same as the well-known text representation. So line equals a line string class around a list right here, right, with point tuples, tuples. 
And then, if you want to create a dilated line, a buffered line, it's just line.buffer and the distance you want to buffer around it, in this case 0 0.5. If you want to erode the, li the buffer, so now it's a polygon, right? Just buffer a negative value, it'll erode it away. And I, I'm not showing you it right now, but you can then plot them. And so that's the original line, that's the buffered line, and here's the buffered line, and here's the eroded line. It's really easy. Just to buffer it, you just call buffer. Super, super simple. And then we could, I could do an intersection and all sorts of fun things like that. Okay? And just to show you what the Python geo interface looks like, here is line.geo interface. Um, and it's just basically a dictionary which stores the type, it's a line string, and the coordinates. And if this was a feature, it wasn't just a geometry, then we might have like attributes associated with it and things like that. But in this case, it's just so that now any uh, you know, library that's going to deal with geometries could just take this Python dictionary, which is a generic object, and do something cool with it, like create the super geometry, which lets you do you know, optimized queries or something. So that's pre pretty cool. So that's Shapely. And so here's... Uh, uh, so here are some various different things you can do, right? Here's A is a geometry dot difference B. Those are two circles, so difference them. So you're erasing one from another. Uh, B dot difference A. Dif you're erasing A from B. Uh, here's some polygons. Then you can union them. So this would be union all these polygons. Here's an intersection, asymmetric difference, yada, yada, yada. All sorts of geometric operations. So things that, if you use a GIS, you go to like, you know, I don't know, analysis, buffer, da -da -da -da. you can do it in just super quick. Very cool. Um, so, to show you how this um, might work, here is an example using CartoPy, where we're going to play around with geometries a little bit, and we're going to map the path of Hurricane Katrina, because I could get the data for that. Okay, from the CardoPy documentation, so you can actually you know, go back later if you want and check out the example. So, from shapely.geometry, import line string. And you can imagine that you could also do from shapely.geometry, import polygon or multi polygon or point or any of the simple feature specifications. And if you imagine that, you'd be right. And then, so here's the longitudes, there's the latitudes. So, I'm going to take those and I'm going to make a shapely line string. And I use this fancy thing called zip. People know about this? Right, it's great. Especially when you're working with la like coordinates. Because you can switch between like tuples and two separate things. And I'll show you an example in a second. So here's the Cur Hurricane Katrina track. And it's a line string. Okay? And what I want to do is I want to buffer that line string to get an idea of the sort of potential path of damage that Katrina made. And I read somewhere, maybe possibly, that uh, at one point it was about 200 kilometers wide in terms of damage, okay? Or in terms of coverage. That could be totally wrong, but we're going to go with that, okay? So if I buffer the line by about 2 degrees, okay, that's about 200 kilometers. But that doesn't really make sense because 2 degrees is, in terms of like actual distance on the Earth, is different depending on what latitude you're at. So it's not very smart to measure distances using geographic coordinates, right? And right now, my geometry is represented as geographic coordinates. So it should be about 200 kilometers, but it's not really that accurate. And I already answered that question. Shoot. I was supposed to be for you guys. Um, okay. But anyway, let's just say we want to do it anyway. So Katrina buffer is equal to Katrina underscore track dot buffer two, two degrees. Okay? And so now I have a geometry which represents a buffer of the path of Katrina, okay? And now, what if I decided that's not good enough, let's reproject the Latin long coordinates into something where I can measure distances more appropriately, so a projection that preserves distances better, okay? So a lot of maps of Katrina, when it hit landfall, were happened to be in UTM zone 16, around there. So a lot of maps that you may have seen of sort of like Katrina damage use UTM zone 16. And you can, UTM um, uh, zones, you can measure distances pretty nicely in there, right? Because they're just 
fine slices and there's less distortion. But the whole path doesn't exist in UTM zone 16. It actually exists mostly not in UTM zone 16. Uh, so here is an opportunity to use a custom proj string where we're going to specify a projection that isn't in the database necessarily. Okay. And uh, I'm going to use Lambert conformal conic projection. Why might I want to use that? Any takers? Distances? Oh, yeah, I guess I kind of gave that away, didn't I? Yes, correct. Yes, it's good for that. Pretty good for that. Um, okay, so here I go. Uh, from PyProj, import proj, and uh, something called transform, okay, which allows me to transform uh, the set of coordinates from one projection to another. Um, and I create a proj object, or a, a proj dictionary, which is this custom proj4 string, where the ellipse I'm using is WGS84, and the projection is Lambert conformal comic. And the rest are just uh, specifying lat long origins and offsets. Okay? So I create a source and a destination proj object, okay? So the source is... EPSG 4326, lat long coordinates. The destination is this projection. Okay, and I take this line string and I transform the coordinate store. I'm going to talk a little bit about what this is. And then I create a new one, which is the projected track. Okay, so what I've done is I've run transform, where I've specified the source and the destination projection, and I've transformed the longitudes and the latitudes. And that gets me back basically. Again, the list of longitudes and latitudes like I had before, except now they've been projected into a Lambert conformal conic projection. Okay, and then I zip it so that they become tuples, and I specify those tuples to the line, for a line string. Okay, and I've got an example to kind of show you, break that down a little bit better. Okay, so now I've done that. Now I'm going to buffer this correctly projected line string by 200 kilometers, 200 times 1,000. Okay, because it's in meters. And now I have a projected buffer object. Okay? Okay, so a quick little aside here. Coordinate tuples and XY sequences. Okay? This is actually copied directly from the course last year because it's useful. Okay? So basically this star thing is like unpacking. You're going to unpack something into two separate pieces. So if we've got a, uh, like a, a set of X's and a set of Y's, and we use this star thing. I think I'm just describing the opposite way, but anyway, it unpacks it into two separate things, and if we zip it, it zips it up into tuples of X and Y coordinates. So, here's an example, right? Points are, is a list of tuples with coordinates. If I want to get the X's and the Y's separate, I just unpack and zip it up, and then I get a tuple of X's and a tuple of Y's. Pretty cool. Uh, you can also do this inside of functions, right? So this function just adds 0.5 to each coordinate. So if I just call <coughs> function, unpack the points, zip them up, and then unpack them, I get this. I've just added 0.5 to all the co coordinates. And then there's a, this is a, a one where if you've got like a big uh, array of points or something, you can use this. So it takes a little while to get used to doing that, but it saves you nanoseconds <laughs> when you're programming when you're writing code. So that's handy. So keep that page handy. All right, so now let's do a plotting example, okay? Uh, if you're following along on the notebooks, uh, I'm, going to tell, I'm going to say I left this out on purpose so that you would have to be careful. Um, but make sure that you do this first. Import matplotlib.pyplot as plot. So like add a new cell and run this cell before you run the example. Uh, make sure it's matplotlib inline, and then import cartopy.crs as ccrs. So start with that, insert a cell, run it. I'll leave this up for a few more seconds. I can still hear keyboards tapping. Okay, I'm going to move on. No? Um, okay, so yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> so here we go. Here's the figure. Flannel. So I start by creating a figure 
Just like before, I specify axes all this time in Lambert conformal conic projection at the top. I'm going to use some stock image background, which is just a helper function that CartoPy provides. So it makes this nice background here. Uh, I'm going to add the coastlines at a re resolution of 110 million to 1. Yep. Um, so, and that's another sort of useful thing. And then I'm going to add two add geometries. Okay. One is the Katrina buffer. Uh, and so we start with the Katrina buffer and then the Katrina track. Okay. In, um, and I specify that these are in plat carré, just regular old x and or, uh, lat long coordinates. Okay. And I color them blue for fun. And then I add the projected buffer to that, this thing here, proj buffer. And that is already in Lambert conformal conic, so I specify that here. I make that one green, uh, set an extent so that it's not, so that, you know, it's nice plotted. Add some grid lines for fun, and then I show that plot. And so now I have the path of Katrina with the blue one, which is the original distance, and the green one is the projected um, buffer. And as you can see, they're not exactly the same. They're a little bit off. This kind of demonstrates that when you're calculating distances, if you don't use projections correctly, then you get mistakes. Now, in this case, I'm pretty sure these people right here were just as worried as these people right here about the hurricane, but you can see how these different differences could make a difference. And so down at the bottom here, which shapely geometry method could we use to find where the tracks differ? Any guesses? The answer is in the question. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so just to stay on track, because we lost some time with that disruption, I'm going to keep moving on, but I'm happy to come back to this later. Okay. It's, you know, kind of classic matplotlib type stuff where it's a little finicky to get things working, but you can produce some nice... Maps. Okay, raster data representation. Uh, so we are going to work with imagery and digital elevation models today a little bit. But, you know, rasters could be all sorts of other types of gridded-based um, data. Okay? Um, so rasters in the Python world are pretty easy to talk about because we use NumPy so much, which is, you know, arrays or grids. Um, but basically, the spatial representation for a raster is we've got this some sort of phenomenon that we can represent continuously over an area. Um, we can't generally divide it into vector features, right? No, they're not unique polygons and things like that. Um, and ultimately, the spatial representation is both the data and the location all in the same grid, right? Uh, and the way we reference this to the real world, or georeference, is we know the size of each grid cell. We know how much area it covers, or at least we should. Uh, we know how many cells there are in the x and y directions, because we've got this grid, right? Uh, so if we know where the corners are located, then we can figure out where this whole array sits on the planet, right? So if we have a regular image like this, and we've got a transformation. I'll explain what this is in a second. This is actually just a snippet of a, something called a world file where it specifies where in the world this file covers. And if we take these two bits of information, we get something like this, okay, which is a raster image located in geographic space, or a geospatial image or a geospatial raster. We're not going to make 3D plots today. That's a little disappointing, but sorry. Uh, OK, so question is, how do we do this stuff in Python? Um, this, at first, this is a little bit kind of, you're never going to do this, but it's for demonstration purposes, so bear with me. Okay, so say we import matplotlib.image as pmpm, okay, just because it's shorter, um, and we read in a png file, okay? In this case, if you're following along, the png file is manhattan.png, it's in the data file. And if you just use this off path, and no matter what system you're on, it should get the right path. Uh, you'll notice that I don't use, I don't ever use slashes or anything like that, just to make things a little simpler for everybody. Okay, so I get that file and I read it in using imread from matplotlib, and I have an image object. Okay, 
And that image object is just a NumPy array, basically, right? Where it's uh, 5205 five by 5757 five by 3 are the dimensions. 3 being red and green and blue color bands. Okay? And the other ones are just the dimensions in the X and the Y um, planes. Okay? So, what we have, basically, is just an image. Okay? Just an image, not, not a geospatial image. Because a raster data set or a geospatial image, in addition to the pixel information which we just loaded in, also has a coordinate reference system, just like vector data, and probably some sort of a, a, a transformation matrix which tells us how to transform it from just uh, its uh, row and column numbers to somewhere on the planet. Okay? Uh, so... And basically, that uh, uh, a fine transformation, it just maps the pixels in the image, or the grid cells in the grid, to the X and Y locations in the coordinate reference system that is associated with that uh, raster. Okay? Um, and the, pretty, the cool thing about this is, if you just want to get the X and Y coordinates of the upper left corner of any pixel in the image, you can just take the product of the affine transformation matrix which I'm going to show you in a second, and the tuple column and row that you're trying to get the coordinates for. Okay? So this is an example that I, I did not tell you to install this library because it's just for demonstration purposes. You don't need it. And actually, if you install new versions of raster, Rasterio or Raster.io, uh, then you will need this anyway. Uh, but the pip version doesn't. Anyway, so we, I'm going to create an affine matrix. We're going to find transformation matrix. If you, are, you want to know like, exactly how this works under the hood, Google a fine transfer t transformation matrix. I'm not really going to talk about it here. It's just a matrix that we use to transform coordinates from cell coordinates to real-world coordinate reference system coordinates. Okay? So I'm going to create an affine matrix with various different parameters, which I'm just giving to you. You, don't, you wouldn't uh, figure this up on your own. And I'm going to calculate the upper left and lower right corners of the image. Okay, so 0, 0 is the top, and the shape, the last two things of the shape at the bottom are the, you know, I'm getting these two cell numbers. Okay? Uh, and I can just print that out, and the upper left coordinate is this, and the lower right coordinate is that, and that essentially describes the bounding box of our raster in real, in, uh, excuse me, in this case, um, I think they are NAD, 80, NAD 27 coordinates of some kind. Not important. Okay, so that's how we get that. So this is kind of not anything you're ever going to do, but this is what's happening in the background when you're working with raster, okay? Uh, oh, here we go. The coordinate reference system is NAD 83 UTM zone 18. Okay, this is an a t a image of... Manhattan, uh, and the affine transformation I gave you, and later on we'll actually just get this information from the raster data sets themselves. Okay, that was a little complicated, but let's keep moving here. So, just as an example, okay, quick example. Um, here again is the upper left and bottom right corners in UTM coordinates, okay? Left top is the affine transformation times upper left. Right bottom is the affine transformation, the transformation times the lower right. Okay? Right top, lower bottom. Or right bottom. And I'm just going to plot it using regular, normal, matplotlib, imshow calls. Okay? Nothing fancy here. No special geospatial stuff. So the first one, I'm just calling imshow, and I'm just showing the image. Okay? And here it is, picture of Midtown Manhattan. And the coordinates go from 0 to 5,000 something and 0 to 5,000 something, right? And those are just row and column coordinates. No geospatial information whatsoever. In the second plot, I go M show, and then I specify the extent which we calculated using the affine transformation matrix. And now, the X and Y, it looks the same, but the X and the Y coordinates are in geographic or they're in UTM zone 18 coordinates. So it's sitting in the right spot. So now if I wanted to make a plot and I want to add some 
points in uh, UTM zone 10, they would sit on top of that where they should sit. Okay? Yes? So you could then cut this image. Once you have the correct coord uh, coordinates, you could then cut this up and turn this into a base map and say serve it through something. Yep. In fact, um, you could definitely, I mean, you could just, yeah, well, you could like uh, break it up into cells. You could run, um, I don't know, GDAL to tiles or something like that and make a base map or whatever, yeah. Although I probably don't have the rights to do that with this one, but if, you, if it was an image you made or something like that, you could. Yep. Or you can, in Python, just plot stuff on top of it and use it as a base map as is. Or you could save it as a, well, I'll show you later, but you could save it as like a geotiff, which is a geospatial image in the TIFF format, and then you could load it into a GIS or you could give it to whoever you want. Okay? Okay, so, next example. Plotting great circles in Python. Okay, so here we're going to use various different <clears throat> tools that we've looked at so far to plot the great circle root of Edward Snowden. But we're going to do it correctly. This, this, is, a, this is from Sky News, this one. I, uh, this example was from last year as well, and it's so good that you, I had to do it. Um, so here, we're gonna, we have, you have to do better than this, which is not hard. Okay? Um, and here's all the things that you need. Um, so, you know, import the libraries that you need. That's pretty much all you need. Um, here are the coordinates for Hawaii, Hong Kong, Moscow, Havana... I don't know if I pronounced this right, so I'm just not going to. And those, those are the places he visited, okay? And just because I'm a nice guy, I made two lists which have these coordinate tuples in them and some labels. Um, and for the brave, if you want to add labels to the plot, you can try, okay? Uh, there's, an, there's, if you want to click here and you have internet connectivity, you can try to do the labels thing if this turns out to be too easy. So, there's a few tasks along the way. First, you're going to create some simple feature line string using Shapely and well, and then you go, I want you to print out the well-known text representation of that line string. Okay, this is easy and kind of the rest of the thing does not rely on it, so if you can't get that working, no problem. Then, you're going to plot a simple map with great circle lines for his journey. Um, <clears throat> use a simple generic base map and um, use the, a Robinson projection, okay? You could use other projections if you want to explore the projections that are available in Cartopi, or Cartopi um, but I've, I've suggested you use Robinson, okay? So there, your plot commands are going to go in there, and then here you can try the same thing again, but with labels if you want, okay? So I'll give you like 10 minutes to do that. And then in the meantime, if still there's install problems or anything like that, put up your hand and uh, I can try and help with that. Okay, so it's, do I have the correct time? It's almost 3 o'clock? Yep. Yeah. And I have until what time? Five. Oh, great. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, they give us, because I've 
a space map in Forum. Well, uh, actually, you have a folder download somewhere that does this for you. There's no point. It's just to make sure you do it. <laughs> the, f the later steps don't depend on it. I anticipated that question. This is what we want. Note that you don't fly all the way across the world to get from Hawaii to Hong Kong. I could, and that would have been ideal. Challenge acceptable. Well, I'll wait until people have tried it before I do that. Yeah, I use, I use that in all my classes. I didn't put that, I can't believe I didn't put that on there. It's too big to fit on a slide, that's the problem. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. What your favorite map projection says about you? Mercator, see? Mercator, you're not really into maps. <laughs> but this is, this is the best one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Call Peters, I hate you. Anyway. Uh, yeah, that's some fun there. Oh. If you get bored of this, don't forget there's food out there. Okay. 
Do people want more time to work on it? Or they want to see this A solution? I will, I'll take your silence as a little bit more time. Well, I'll do it, but I don't want to show the code. I want a computer with internet so I can check. Do you not have internet? I do, but I don't want to sh do it here. I want to. I want to see if I can do the polar coordinate one. You can pip install base map as well. The only problem with doing it from pip, I think, is you have to do the initial install and then go get the full resolution data, which, I mean, is good or bad, depending on whether you think it's, you want to download all the data with just the code or whatever. But yeah, because it uses um, natural earth shape files and various images and things it, like that. GMT data, basically. Oh, yeah, right. For pip and really, pip install. Anyone else able to pip install base map? Not that you don't need it for this, but. Did you? Oh. Uh, You're way ahead of us. Way ahead. Okay, cool. But we do need it. We do need it. I can't install it. It's telling me. Um, can I show you? Mm-hmm. I made about everything else Uh, I'm just trying to see if I have a rotated pole. All right, let's see if this one works. Okay, are we ready to see the results or the solution? Okay, 
All right, so these first thing, two things you already did. Create a simple features line string using Shapely and print the well-known text. So obviously from shapely.geometry import line string. And all you had to do is do root equals line string stops. And then you just print root dot well-known text and you get the well-known text. And it's exactly as you would give it to any application that uses well-known text. Okay. There you go. That's pretty cool. You don't actually need that for the second part of the assignment. The second part, uh, okay, is pretty simple. You make a plot. Oh, I gave you this stuff, I think, right? Okay, so to add an image background, it's just ax, ax dot stock image, kind of like from the example before. I added coastlines. I didn't tell you you had to do that. Um, and then we used, I used this uh, 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 zip. You could actually have used the um, geometry itself and, and use add geometries. Um, but I unzipped, unpacked, and zipped it up to get x and y coordinates. And then I plotted them with a line, and then I plotted them as dots. And I specified geodetic because that's their x or their lat long coordinates for the transformation. And so if you run that, it takes a little while because it's downloading imagery from the internet. And it says something about the Robinson projection being wonky. That's okay. Uh, and you got that. Did anyone get uh, labels to work? Sort of. Nice. Uh, I, that's something I would like to see become a little easier in Cardo Pi, if anyone who's working. Well, but so I just did uh, use the text function, but then I had to just pass in the. Did I not do it right? I mean, I passed in the transform and. Oh, uh, well, that's cool. Text. And it just worked? Seems to have. I was a little worried, yeah, like I thought maybe the text would be warped or something. Yeah. Maybe, but Didn't? it's not. Oh, cool. Maybe that's better. That I had to do this to get it to work. Does anybody want to work on that in the open source days? Um, making those labels work better in part of five? Maybe you don't need it. I don't, yeah, I don't, I mean. It looks good? I, I mean, it's Maybe you need documentation, yeah. Maybe it does, yeah. Well, actually, this is what the documentation tells you to do. Yeah. So that's an easy fix. Just change that. That's great. Yeah. Bonus points over here. Uh, okay, so if we hit enter and run that, uh, we get some labels. But I have changed the projection to see if we could do a rotated pole. That's not the projection I thought it was. Does anybody know in Cartopi what a, uh, if there's a polar coordinate one? North Polar Stereo. We'll try it. I have no idea if this is going to work. There we go. That's pretty cool. Uh, it's maybe with the labels, it's a bit hard to read. Yeah, you probably want to clip it at the equator or something. Well, uh, yeah, I guess we should have clipped it here. The imagery is square, so it's trying, but you know, pretty good, yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, yeah. I didn't actually change anything except this. So if you want to do it properly, you have to change some of the parameters, but pretty easy to just to do that. Pretty cool. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's more like a weird projection. But anyway, that's great. Yep, all I changed was this. But, yeah, just keep in mind that this is not good mapping. Uh, okay, great. Um, so that's that assignment. So, well, we kind of had a break with that whole uh, emergency uh, alarm thing. Um, 
So this one's pretty short. So we'll do this one, and then I'll, we'll take a break. OK? Um, so tutorial part three. Uh, again, if, we ha if you have any questions about some of the stuff that we've uh, covered so far, I'm happy to go back over it. I'm hoping that there'll be a little time at the end to go through anything that people got tripped up on or anything like that. So here we go, tutorial part three, um, which is data formats. And we're going to be doing some data I.O. in this uh, geospatial data I.O. stuff. Input, output for those who aren't familiar with that one. So here's, here's an, I have to have an XKCD comic in every presentation I ever give. <laughs> so here's one, OK? Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, data standards a little bit. Um, because we have all sorts of different data. We've already talked about a little bit about the different, different data that we have, right? Vector versus raster. And there's lots of different ways to represent vector versus raster. Some of them are standards. Some of them are, you know, esoteric little uh, formats that people use. Um, but there's lots of different formats to store the data. And pretty much every piece of software seems to have its own special format, right? If it's a proprietary piece of software, it's probably because they've optimized you know, their piece of software to work with some particular format. Um, if it's, you know, or, they, or they've just organized, they, they think in a certain way, they use this particular data model, whatever it is, there's different data formats to represent them. Um, so we do have some standards in the geospatial world, some standard da uh, data formats that we use. And the nice, th nice thing about standards is this classic quote, right? Nice thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. Um, and so this XKCD comic uh, encapsulates that uh, situation perfectly. There are 14 competing standards. Ridiculous, we need one universal standard that everyone will use. And then later on, there are now 15 competing standards. And that's why there are so many different data formats that we have to be able to understand and work with in the geospatial world. Okay? So also, we've just got different types of data that we want to interact with. So text files, obviously, are pretty common. CSV files, fixed width files, Excel files. I'm sure pretty much everyone here has had to interact with that type of data. Uh, then we have GeoJSON, which is a nice web interchange format for geospatial data, becoming very popular. Um, and that kind of under the hood uses a well-known text, simple features representation for the geometry parts. Uh, then there's this newer thing, TopoJSON, which is kind of funny because it's not the whole idea of a, a topological data structure isn't all that new, but it seems like everybody thinks it is. Anyway, that's kind of well-known text with some modifications. Uh, Esri's got like an ASCII grid format for raster data. Uh, we've got spatial databases, which we'll talk about a little bit today. Um, I just started using this one. It's pretty cool. Uh, then data services for like web mapping, right? We've got web mapping services, web feature services, web, web coverage services, tile map services, all these different things. Not really going to touch that today beyond that we actually are going to use some. Um, and then, you know, some of these are open, some of them are proprietary. These are open uh, data file, uh, file formats. Here's some proprietary ones. If you've ever used a GIS before, you probably use Esri shape files. Um, if you use like drawing packages or you've worked worked with engineers or planners or architects, maybe DWG or DXF. If you work in a you know enterprise environment, some sort of enterprise database, et cetera, et cetera. And if we're gonna write a Python script to interact with data, we better be able to read whatever data format people may end up throwing at us. So with all of these data formats available, how do we use them all together? So there's this awesome library, or kind of two libraries, called, uh, I call it GDAL. I think some people call it Goodle. But I call it GDAL, an OGR, OK? Or Ogre, some people call it Ogre as well. But I'm going to say GDAL and OGR. Geospatial Data Abstraction Library and the OGR Simple Feature Library. And these are two libraries for reading and writing geospatial data formats. GDAL is for raster formats. OGR is for vector formats. We can read, you can write, you can convert, you can edit them. Um, 
work with yeah, a raster and vector. It's kind of like the Swiss Army knife of data formats. You can just whoosh, flip out any you know, tool you need, read that format, convert it to another format, whatever you want. Okay. Um, it is also an OG, or OSGO project. Okay, so it's under the umbrella of OSGO. Um, and it comes with a load of command line utilities that are extremely useful. And actually, sometimes I just use those instead of Python. I know. It's crazy, but sometimes it's just easier to do that. And so something like OGR to OGR is a tool for converting from different vector formats from one to another. And uh, GDAL transform you can use for converting between um, raster formats. And I'll show you examples of that in a second. Um, these are really popular libraries. Everybody uses them. Even com like proprietary GIS software uses this, these open source libraries, which are mo mostly written in C or C++. Anybody know? C++. C++. There you go. Um, yes. Right. So obviously, wouldn't it be great if we could also access these things in Python? Yes, it would. And yes, we can. Right? So we can use, we can use the power of these libraries. Uh, from Python, and I'll show you two, uh, two of my second and third favorite Python packages for interacting with these. Uh, if there's someone here who has a Python package, I apologize that I didn't mention that it was my favorite. Uh, tell me about it later, maybe it'll become my favorite. Okay, so here is a list of a bunch of so different pieces of software that use GDAL and OGR. And just so you know, I used Python to scrape these links off of the web page for OGR and then paste them into this Python notebook. So that's pretty cool, too. Um, so some of these you probably use and know about. There's uh, ArcGIS is in here, Google Earth, um, Saga, GIS, R, if you use R, PostGIS, blah, blah, blah. All the big names are in here. They all use it. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so that's, this, these are software patches that use it. Uh, I also use Python to extract this. This list is too long to fit onto a slide. This is all the different raster data formats that are supported by GDAL. There's some, some of them in here, like, only one organization uses, but they, it, they support reading and writing. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, something like J, JPEG 2000, uh, GeoTIFF is in here. Grass raster stuff, arc info stuff, it's all there. Any, I mean, I, there's, there's, a, there's file formats in here I guarantee you've never heard of. And then the vector formats list is shorter, but pretty, pretty much uh, all encompassing. Um, even things like new, new formats like TopoJSON, which might not be on here, uh, it does. GeoJSON, CouchDB, uh, obviously. Shape files are in here somewhere. Esri shape files. I see Geo Database is in there. Is that new? Esri Geo Personal. Oh, uh, yep. You but you okay? But for that to work, you need to have the Esri, um, what you call it, library. But you can download it for free. Yeah, but then you have to first you have to tell them who you are, and then you yes. have to be able to build it and build GDL or or OGR, which is not fun. Yes, it's a yeah. Not fun, but you can you can do it. So not all of these um, come out of the box. Sometimes you have to compile a special version of GDAL with this. But I'm not going to make you download or, or you know interact with any data that doesn't come out of the box. So you're welcome. Um, okay, so that's cool. So how do we do this in Python, right? Uh, okay, so for vector formats. You can, we use Fiona, okay, uh, which is OGR's neat, nimble, and no-nonsense no, no API, which I think is a great name for it because that's definitely what it is. It's a very Pythonic way of interacting with geospatial uh, vector data. Okay, so you basically you just read vector data, like geospatial vector data, like you'd read any type of file in Python which is great, and you can use like with statements to make sure that you close the file properly and all sorts of fun stuff like that. So it focuses on reading and writing data in standard Python I.O. style. Um, nice, easy um, interfaces to like pretty much whatever you can do in OGR. Um, 
It supports the uh, uh, Python Geo interface, so that means it's, it's, it interacts really nice with any other Python packages, um, and modified BSD license, which means you can use it everywhere. For raster formats, there's a package called ra raster, ra I like rasterio, rasterio, but it's probably just rasterio, right? But anyway, clean, fast, and clean and fast and geospatial raster IO. That might not be what it says on the website. <laughs> But uh, it's great. It's pretty much the same thing. Very Pythonic. You just read in a raster just like you read in any other file. And it, it tags along all sorts of useful attributes of that raster. And it, makes it puts it into uh, NumPy arrays for you. Because that's what you want. Right? Uh, so working with geospatial raster data is fun and productive again. Or now. For the first time. Uh, it's used GDAL under the hood. Right? So it's fast. C++ stuff happening in the background. You get NumPy arrays, modified BSD license, so you can do what you want with it. So that's great too. So here are some examples. Um, here's an example where we're going to convert vector file formats. So I'm going to take a shape file, which you have in your data folder, and I'm going to convert it to GeoJSON. And so that's, this is what we're going to do here. And I'll just go through kind of each line as we go. So, Excuse me. First of all, import Fiona. That's important. And then uh, we'll use this two string helper function like I showed you earlier. And we're going to import OS so that everybody's um, file paths work nicely. And so the first file we're going to load is a, um, the uh, five boroughs of New York City. Okay, so we're going to call that borough file. And it's located there. And then we're going to specify an output file to save the GeoJSON to. And that I'm just going to call nybb.geojson. And I'm going to save it in the data folder. So there you go. So, like all of those data formats that I talked about, uh, Fiona ha supports various different drivers, um, drivers being uh, ways of, or different for file formats. So there's a different driver for each file format, right? So, uh, this with statement basically uh, anything that happens inside of there will have access to all of the drivers that Fiona has access to. Okay, and that's going to depend on your OGR install. I think they may be they may actually be fixed at this stage. But, um, so you uh, basically you register all the different format drivers, and this basically is just a context manager. So anything that happens inside of there has access to all those drivers. Okay, so with Fiona drivers. Uh, you know, uh, colon, and then in here you say, just like regular files, right? Uh, I guess I'll do it here so you can see both screens. So Fiona.open and then just the file path, just like if you're opening a text file or any type of file in Python. And so we use the with statement so that we um, uh, manage the context, and it's going to close properly later on. And I'm going to call it source. So with Fiona.open as source, and then I'm just going to go in, and now I have that source file, and I'm, I'm going to print a few things out. So the first is I'm going to print out the feature count, which is just length of the source, just like you could print the number of lines in a text file. right? Uh, now, a few special things. Source.driver is the driver that we're currently using to read. Uh, in this case, it's going to print Esri shapefile, because that's what I've loaded in. Um, I can get some metadata about the source or the layer or the vector file. So source.meta. And then the cool thing is that meta, uh, meta attribute describes the file. So what driver uh, it used, what's the, uh, what CRS is it in, um, what's its bounding box, blah, 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 blah. All sorts of useful bits and pieces about the vector file. So if I just create an object called meta, and then I update the driver to be GeoJSON, now I've just pulled across all the information from the source change the driver, now I'm going to specify that for my output file, write an output file, done. Super simple, really clean, no one messing about trying to figure out, you know, which attribute types, you know, all that stuff, just pull it straight across. So here's just a little thing to make sure that it didn't screw up if you'd already run it once. If, you know, if the file exists, get rid of it, okay? And then, just with, we're still in the same context here, with Fiona.open, and we're going to open it in write mode and specify the meta 
uh, object, which is actually a dictionary which I'm unpacking to create um, arguments to Fiona.open. Okay, so unpacking double stars. As sync, why not call it source and sync, right? Um, then I'm going to print out the driver for that. Yes, indeed, it is, sync, or it is GeoJSON. And then you just go through the records in the source, for rec in source, exactly like you would with a text file. Sync.write, exactly like you would with a text file. So we're treating geospatial data pretty much just as like any file that you'd have in Python. Very cool. It, you barely even need to learn any new syntax. Right? And now what I've done is I've read in a shapefile, gone through each feature, written it out to a GeoJSON file, and my context of, um, like, I've finished. Files have closed nicely, properly, everything. And afterwards I can check to see if the file now exists, printing true, which is good. And, oh, look, I forgot to put this in presentation mode. Um, and there we go. Very simple, right? Uh, any questions about that? Yep, you can go the other way around too. Yep, no problem. Yep. Uh, yes. Now, reading geospatial raster data. Okay. Uh, so if you haven't downloaded the GeoTIFF for Manhattan, here's a link in the slides here too, and the link from earlier, um, and just put it in your data folder. Okay. If you want to follow along. So here now we import Rast Rasterio. Uh, again, we're going to import two string because it's handy to have. Import OS, and since we're going to do some NumPy stuff, import NumPy as NP. Okay. So the path to the image file, if you have in fact saved the Manhattan.geotiff into the data folder, it should be that. Okay. Nothing special there. And then exact same thing, right? We're going to register format drivers. So with rasterio.drivers, same exact thing as with um, Fiona. With rasterio.open image file and reading it in or opening it in read mode as the source. Uh, let's print a little bit of information about it. Okay, so source.count, that's the number of image bands. Okay, kind of makes sense. Source.shape. Unlike a uh, NumPy array with multiple dimensions, you know, would give you the X and the Y and the Z or whatever. Uh, this is actually just going to print the, the shape of the image, the sort of size that the image covers. So count gives you the extra dimension. Okay. Um, print the driver, in this case it's GeoTIFF. And I'm going to print the source coordinate reference system just because. And in this case, it's NAT83 UTM zone 18 coordinates. Okay? So that's the projection that it's in. Okay? Uh, so we've loaded all that stuff in. It's pretty useful. Uh, what I didn't print out here is that this image, if we go source.transform, it actually has the transform for that image. So remember before I specified the transform to convert it to real world, real world coordinates? Well, when we read it in using Rasterio, it give, we get that. It tells us the transform for it, so that's pretty good. Um, to get data from each band, it's just source.readBand and then the band number. And they start using GDAL um, convention, it starts from 1, not 0. So the first band is band 1, 2, and 3. Okay, I know that's annoying, but that's, it's a convention. Right? So. Uh, so, and those map to red, green, and blue bands in this case. And so I just mapped the source.readBand function to the numbers 1, 2, and 3 to get the red, green, and blue bands, okay, image bands. Uh, and then I stack them into a uh, you know, multi-dimensional NumPy array using numpy.dstack. Okay, this is like pretty much just regular NumPy stuff. And the cool thing is that each band is just an ND array, which I can, well actually each band is a 2D array, which I can just chuck together to make an arbitrarily D array. Right, so you can, I can, you can work with like, you know, hyperspectral imagery and uh, as many bands as you want. So this band, or this image actually does contain an infrared band, um, but I won't, since I can't see that, I'm only going to plot red, green, and blue. Uh, and so, yeah, printing data type, it prints just a NumPy ND array, which is pretty cool. And um, 
So I'm going to want to plot this in a little bit. Okay? And for that, I'm going to use that extent argument to m show. Right? So for that, I need to get the bounds of the image. Now, in the geospatial realm, we always want uh, uh, sort of the, the, the top and bottom of the geospatial raster, right? So x, or actually it's usually this way, x min, y min, x max, y max, in that order. But matplotlib wants it x min, x max, y min, y max. So this bounds thing is just a little shuffling around to get, it, to get the coordinates in that order. Okay? So it's just a little bit of a ray slicing to get things in the right place. Um, okay, so just a quick aside though. Uh, the first step, or the first thing I did with the vector data, uh, could have done it with just this. Right? Um, so that would have been a lot faster and easier, and it's using the command line uh, tools to do it. But Doing it this way gives us all, like I could, you know, I could change things, I could shift the coordinates a little bit, I could do all sorts of cool stuff, which I obviously can't do with just a regular command line. So OGR to OGR, output format is GeoJSON, take the Geo, or there's the output format, there's the input format. That's a command line kind of version of it. We can do the same thing with a raster by using GDAL translate. So GDAL translate output format GeoTIFF, and then here is the bounding box for that GeoTIFF. Here's the, the coordinate reference system for it. We'd use the PNG maybe, and then we'd output a TIFF. Okay, so, you know, the, these are command line tools. Use the best tool for the job, obviously. Um, usually it's Python, but not always, right? So that's a quick little aside. Okay, so a plotting example. Just gonna do geospatial rasters, because um, we're gonna plot vectors later. So, uh, right, if I go back to here, this is what we did to read in the raster. So we don't need this line of text or line of code. So really we could do it with one, two, three, four, five lines of code. Read in the um, raster and get the data, the imagery data. And then, and a bounding box. And then, you know, make a figure and then just plot the mm -hmm. show data and specify the extent. Bam, done. Right, none of that affine transformation stuff that we worried about before. And as you can see, we now have it in the right set of coordinates. It looks right, it looks great. My office is somewhere around here. Um, if you, if that was important to you. Um, and there you go, very simple, right? And we've just plotted a geospatial raster. Okay, so. Um, here is the next assignment, and then we'll take, I don't know, like a 15-minute coffee break or something like that? Get a, get, get a refresh yourself? So I think what I'll do is I'll give you like 20 minutes or so to work on this, get some coffee, come back, and, uh, yeah, that's about right. And then that gives us basically an hour left to finish off the stuff. Okay, so I'm going to start right, 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 right in 20 minutes from now because we still got some stuff to cover. Okay, so go uh, work with rasters, grab some coffee, do whatever you want, and then we'll get we'll come back at. Uh, I don't know if this is correct. I just changed the time on my watch here. So who who has the correct time? What now? 3:37. All right. So exactly 20 minutes from now, come back.